to welcome back Daniel Strickland. Can we please show our appreciation? <laughs> Daniel, thank you so much. Like, we have just loved having your input and your investments, and it was great that you were able to do that for us online, but we're so pleased that you've been here with us in person. So let me just pray, and uh, over to you. God, thank you for Danielle. Thank you for who she is. Thank you for who you've made her to be. Thank you for her family. Thank you for all of the opportunities that you give her to serve and to lead and to show and to encourage. And Lord, today, I pray as she ministers, as she gives out, God, would you fill her up in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow. I have a friend who, when we're done eating, he pushes back from the table and he says, is it supposed to hurt? <laughs> I feel like this is kind of one of those situations, right? I, I'm praying that our spirits would be as expandable as our stomachs. I don't know about yours, but mine, mine's pretty expandable. <laughs> Can we shove some more in? You know, Can we increase our capacity for more revelation and more of God? Uh, yes. The answer is yes, right? We can. We can. God, just... And actually, we, ever, we never really need more of God. He's given us everything. Uh, really, God needs more of us, right? That's the expansion, that's the capacity. So there is no more of God, but there is more capacity in us to receive. And that's what we're praying for, a complete overflow of the revelation of the presence of God in our lives. Yay! Let's do that. Let's do that. All right. Uh, for me, I was thinking, um, you know, where do we go from here? You know, we've, we've, we've got that revelation of the, the, the harvest, you know, that commission to go to not be afraid. We've got that clarity of vision that God is calling us as his people to speak a word of life and creation and power and peace in this moment. We've got this kind of reframe on the holiness of God and the different kind of leader that's required in this uh, age to demonstrate who God is, what God is like, how God works. And now what do we do with it? What do we do with it? I mean, how does it actually work itself out in our actual lives? And I was thinking about the missional impulse. You know, the, the guy that I think has the funniest and also greatest missional impulse to take the gospel everywhere is the Apostle Paul in the scriptures. And uh, I wanted to have a quick look at one of his journeys. And we could just pick any of them because they're actually filled with a lot of comedic value. You know, I mean, literally, if you think it's super clear and you think it's super obvious and you think like it's going to be easy to take the gospel into a place that doesn't know, you know, that, that, that is unaware, then you haven't read Acts. I mean, it is a colossal jumble of like, ah, it's like we don't know what we're doing. I remember my friend uh, Stephanie O'Brien, she wrote a book called Make a Move, which was on spiritual discernment. And she says in the intro of the book, she says, um, I spent my childhood when I was bored at church opening to the back pages of the Bible that where there was like the missionary map of Paul's journey. And she said, I used to just, when I was bored, I would just follow the arrows in the map and just kind of for something to do. And then she said, I was called to ministry and I graduated from seminary and I was about to start. And she said, I said to the Lord, okay, give me my map. And the Holy Spirit said to her, <laughs> her Oh, I drew those after he went. <laughs> I, I drew those after. <laughs> I were talking to a, a mother who was just distraught because her daughter was actually just leaving her tradition, not leaving Jesus, but just leaving like the tradition of her, you know, of her church. And she just was like trying everything she could to keep her to stay. And she was struggling, and she came to me panicked one day because she asked me to help. You know, she said, I need you to help me keep my daughter in this church, you know. I said, yeah, that's, that's not what I do. <laughs> that's not what I do. But I can help your daughter discern. Together we could discern maybe what Jesus is asking her to do. Together we could discern what it is that God wants for her life. Together we could discern, you know, and it might take some... It might take some readjustment of what it is that we want, you know. And then she said to me very genuinely, she said, well, how do I know if surrender is letting go or hanging on? And I was like, that's a good question. Because surrender is both. 
Surrender, a posture of surrender is laying down your agenda. It's, it's giving over. It is, it's letting go of some of the stuff that you might imagine this looking like. It's letting go of, but it's also hanging on to what God has called you to do. It's also hanging on to the promise and possibilities of God's kingdom come in your own life. It's also hanging. So I'm like, I don't know. I don't know, but I know this. You can't just decide it's one thing. You actually can only practice surrender in relationship to Jesus. It cannot be a principle you live by. It doesn't work like that. Surrender is a practice. Surrender is a relationship of intimacy where we listen to God together and do whatever he says. That's what surrender is. That's what makes it so stinking difficult. If only it was just a principle and every single time I let go. If only it was just a principle and every time I hung on. Has anyone ever here water skied? This happened to me when I was water skiing. This revelation came to me because when you're water skiing, it's very difficult to understand. But when you're trying to get up, this boat is pulling you and you're holding on to this rope. And what you have to do is you have to hang on for your life. And it's against, it's literally, you are coming up on the water and it's moving against the current. It is, everything is against you. The force is against you. The momentum is against you. And the guy teaching me how to water ski in the boat is saying, don't let go. And I felt the spirit say, that's, that's actually what I need you to do a lot of times. Against the current, against the culture, against the, the momentum, against the, this is going to be difficult. Don't let go. So I'm going to be like, I'm not letting go. And then I get up on the water. It's like a miracle. I'm like on the water. I'm basically Jesus. <laughs> and then my ski, the top of my ski hits like at, at a weird angle, at a wrong angle. And I'm falling and I'm, cr I'm crashing and I'm falling. And the guy in the boat, the same guy yells at me, let go, <laughs> let go. Because <laughs> if you hang on when you're in that moment, you're gonna die. <laughs> so what do you do when you're trying to water ski, you know? Do you let go or do you hang on? Yeah, it depends on the circumstance. It depends on the circumstance. Paul, uh, Acts 16 is one of my favorites, so we'll just have a look at this together, if you don't mind. Acts 16, we'll start at verse 6. This is Paul literally taking the gospel into a new territory. This first time the gospel's gotten to Europe, okay? And Paul's taking it there. So this is a big deal. Next, Paul and Silas travel through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. What? <laughs> the Holy Spirit did what? Weird, right? The Holy Spirit prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia. But again, the spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. What? So instead, they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. And that night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia... I want you to repeat after me, a man. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we, I want you to repeat that, we. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded together that God was calling us to preach the good news there. I was uh, headed to a conference a couple years back and, uh, you know, was speaking on the Friday night and I, I got to the airport, I cleared customs, so I was in this like little section of the airport and you ever have, I don't know if you travel much, but there are these moments in travel that are just so desperately terrible. And I remember going, literally going up to the gate and watching my plane back away and, you know, you're just like, well, missed that one. <laughs> They will not open that hatch. Like, you cannot run and jump on that. That's not a thing. So I called the conference, and I said, hey, I'm not going to make it. The next plane is in four hours, so tonight you'll have to find a different speaker. And, you know, like, I'm, and we're all just like, oh, what a drag, what a drag. Four hours later, I get on this plane, and I sit down on the plane, and there's a, 
a guy beside me who looks like Tony Robbins. Do you know him? He's like, a, he's like you know, self-help guru. He's got shiny teeth. Uh, he's in like a thousand dollar suit. I'll never forget it actually because he had uh, wasabi flavored almonds. They changed my life. I mean, <laughs> if you've never had those, those are incredible. But anyway, I digress. So he's sitting there and he looks at me. And he's just like one of those guys that just like has it all together. He's obviously wealthy. He's obviously all these things. So I'm just like, ugh. And I'm four hours in this silly little airport and I've missed my conference and I'm really, really ticked off. And I sit down and he turns to me with his big cheese smile and he says what do you do and those are when you're a, you know, a leader you know this these are questions that you have to discern you know sometimes I open with like well I speak or sometimes I open with well I write or sometimes I'm like it's none of your business <laughs> leave me alone did you not see my headphones like the universal sign I'm not interested in the conversation and this time, I really just wanted to shut that down quick. So I said, I fly around the world telling people about Jesus. That usually does it. <laughs> and this guy looks at me and he goes, oh, so does that make you an evangelist? I said, huh, it does. But how do you know that? He goes, well, funny enough, when I flew in here, I'm just here for the weekend on business. He said, I flew in here and I sat next to an evangelist. I, I said to him, how long have you been running from God? <laughs> and he says to me, how did you know? <laughs> I said, buddy, this flight's costing me quite a bit to be here right now, so can we just get this business done? <laughs> Give the evangelist a break. What is going on, you know? And he began to just disclose, like, I'm bankrupt. My fiance left me. My life is an absolute mess. I don't know how to get rid of the shame. I don't know how to get rid of the fear. I don't know. Out of him poured all of these needs, and out of me poured the gospel. There's a way to start again. There's a way to be forgiven. There's a way to live for something more than money. There's a way to actually live that would give your life purpose that's beyond what you could imagine or dream or possibly ask. And he gave his life to Jesus, and I got a bag of wasabi almonds. <laughs> Woo! We're winning. I got off the plane and I was saying goodbye to him in the baggage uh, area. And he said to me, Danielle, I just need to tell you, you saved my life tonight. And I said, oh, pff, come on. Jesus saves lives. You know what I mean? Like, it's Jesus. It's not me. And he goes, no, that's not what I meant. He said, tonight was the night. I was going to take my own life. I had it planned. I had it sorted but for you being on that plane. That is not the way I would have gone. He's not the guy I would have chosen. This is not the way I saw it happen. My priority was to get to the conference. My priority was to do the job that I had been asked to do, to speak to the thousands of people I was supposed to speak to that night. God's priority was the man. That's how God works. It's not always clear. But if we're in a place where we're open, if we're in a place where we're in relationship, if we're in a place where we can, we can feel the Holy Spirit. So if you're looking for like, I don't know how to work this out. I don't know how to do this in my ministry. I don't know how to take this revelation God gave me this way. I don't know what to do. Don't worry, God will show you. And here's the news. God will show you in a variety of ways. He's gonna show you by closed opportunities. He's going to show you by missed places. He's going to show you by tension and unresolved. He's going to show you through frustration because you wanted this to happen, but it's not happening. And then he's going to show you through visions. He's going to show you through collective, collective uh, discernment. He's going to show you as you submit what God has told you to do to the people in your company because it's a holy kind of power that way. He's going to do it together in a community. He's going to create places of openness. So they get this vision of this uh, guy calling out to them. So that's what they do. They go. 
We boarded a boat at Troas. We sailed straight across to the island of Samothra. So the next day we landed at Neapolis. From, from there we reached Philippi. This is going, Philippi is going to be a major advance of the gospel for the, for the world. This is a major, we know this later. We're going to read about them later. There's whole letters to that church years and years later. There's going to be disciples made here. There's going to be an impact for Europe made here. This is going to be a positive stronghold, a Christian stronghold for the advancement of missionaries around the world. That's what's happening here. And this is the beginning of it. They go to Philippi, a major city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people, what they thought were men, would be meeting for prayer. So this is in every Roman colony, there would be a synagogue. Paul's strategy whenever he would advance the gospel was to go to the Jews first, and then he would go to the philosophers in the center of the city. That was his, you go to the Jews first and then you go to the Greeks. And that was his strategy of ministry. So he's going to find the synagogue. The synagogue is often by a river because, of course, of all their cleansing rituals. But they couldn't find any men. All they could find were some women. You know, you need 10 Jewish men to start a synagogue. So that'll give you a picture of how few Jewish believers were in Philippi. There weren't even 10 men, not enough to create a synagogue. There were only women. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshiped God. And as she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. And she and her household were baptized and she asked us to be her guests. If you agree that I'm a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. Do you think if God had given Paul a vision of a woman calling him to Macedonia, he would have went? Do you remember in uh, Acts 10, you know, Peter, it's Peter's vision of the Gentiles. Do you remember if you want the world's worst gospel presentation, just read Acts 10. Peter is the worst. I literally, I've never heard it, and I've done bad ones myself, but he literally walks into a Gentile home, people who are seeking God, and he says, you guys know you're unclean, right? (laughs) That's his opening line. (laughs) Well done, Peter. There's some good news right there. You remember, and then it's after he goes. It's very interesting because we convince ourselves, and this is true of me too. I try to convince myself that once I understand it, then I will go and do it. In my experience of reading the scriptures, the opposite is true. Once I go with the spirit to do it, then I understand it. Isn't it the weirdest thing? We have so many wasted hours and hours and and councils and discussions about trying to understand the missional impulse of God. Instead of actually going with the Holy Spirit (laughs) and finding out for ourselves what this means. Peter says, literally, after Cornelius is filled with the Holy Spirit in the exact same way as the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit because of what we talked about last night. He literally says, I get it now. God shows no partiality. The gospel is for everybody. Oh, now I get it. And I think this is Paul's moment because Jewish religious leaders would have, uh, would have literally woken up every morning and thanked God that they weren't a Gentile. They would have also thanked God that they weren't born a woman. And then they would have thanked God that they weren't born a slave. Look at the impulse of the gospel, the power of God. Where does it go? It goes to a Gentile. It goes to a woman. And it's going to go to a slave, guys, in just a couple of verses. The impulse of the gospel is to actually reverse the prejudices and the religious impulses and the exclusions that we've grown up with, the prejudices. It can't go there. So uh, years ago, I was a social justice director for the Salvation Army in Australia. In Australia, they're called the Salvos. It's kind of the national nickname of them. And I was being mentored by this incredible leader and she slipped me this book of like the historical story of the Salvation Army doing these things in society, sort of challenging social evils. And the one story that captivated me was the invasion of the Japanese brothels. 
I read this story. It is insane. There's like 50 Japanese Salvation Army people in, in, in 1920. They've just started the Salvation Army there, and the, the English guy comes over and says, okay, what are we doing? Why is the Salvation Army in Japan? And they said, God spoke to us and said, the Salvation Army has been raised up in Japan to shut down this brothel system. The brothel system is, in Japan is like Bangkok, Thailand right now. There were 20,000 young girls who had been in sexual servitude uh, uh, put in there to pay the debt off for their family's debt. And it was like an open secret in the city. Nobody talked about it, but everybody knew about it. And obviously a lot of people frequented it. And it was an evil and the Holy Spirit had said to them, you've got to stop it. And the English commander said, ah, you're a little outnumbered. You're a little outnumbered. And the Japanese commander said, what do you mean? There's 50 of us plus God. <laughs> so they went and they invaded these brothels. And this is what they did. They, they made a million copies of a magazine that, they, that said why, why women shouldn't be for sale. They, they phoned the media and said, this is the date of our first invasion in case you want to cover it. Uh, clever. And then they, uh, then they prayed. They prayed all night long. They just prayed for the power of God. They just prayed for the courage to go. They just prayed for an opening to be there. They just prayed that, that they had heard right together, that they had discerned this thing. And after they were done praying, <laughs> they went in all these different groups. And all the group needed was a big bass drum at the start, because everyone knows if you're going to invade a brothel, you need a bass drum. <laughs> common knowledge. And so they just have this big bass drum and they march out to the brothel and they make this big circle in this open brothel system. And they say, any girl who wants to be free from this oppression can come into the middle of the circle and you're with us now. We'll take care of you. We'll figure this out. We'll walk together into your freedom. So immediately seven girls hear this. They're like, this is crazy. So they come running. They get into the center of the circle. The Salvation Army people kind of make this, make this huddle this is where it gets a little Monty Python in my mind, because then I don't, how do you exit? But anyway, <laughs> they exit. <laughs> and just as they're exiting, the brothel owners go, wait, hey, this isn't allowed. You can't, they belong to us. And so they sick their goons on them. So then these goons come, you know, the bodyguards or whatever, and they start beating the, the Salvation Army people on the outside of the circle, you know, which, by the way, is a wonderful picture of, the, of holiness, by the way, that we protect the vulnerable, that we, this, this, it, this exclusive circle is designed with others at the center. Anyway, so they're, you know, they're beating these salvationists. And just as they start beating these people, the media arrive. And it's like, click, 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 click. It's a frenzy for a media, right? So then the next day in the paper are these front of the paper is like salvationary people getting beaten for trying to free girls from sexual servitude. Now it's a ruckus. The public is outraged. The secret is up. If you know the, the culture of Japan, it's a safe face culture. So this is like, ah, this is so countercultural. So uh, they keep going back every single Saturday, by the way. And uh, 57 girls, I think they rescued, just one at a time, going in, taking a beating, inviting the girl, going back, starting a safe house, going back in, taking a beating, media clicks every Saturday. Three months into this campaign, the Japanese parliament are forced by public pressure to hold an emergency parliamentary meeting. In that meeting, they make a rule that says, they make a new law that says any girl that wants to exit this can exit so of her own accord. The next day, 13,000 of them leave. So I'm like, yeah! It's going to be an evasion, you know? I'm there to stop sexual exploitation. I'm there to try to uh, rescue uh, people from trafficking. I'm trying to help. I'm trying to break down this oppressive thing. So I'm, I'm also on this committee for the Salvation Army for their big gathering, kind of like this, where they, all the leaders gather and they have a celebration. It's like this, but they're all in uniform, so it's more like a happy feet convention, I call it. But <laughs> they also sing really good, but they don't dance, so there's that. So anyway... We're there, and I'm on this committee to make this thing uh, half decent, and I'm driving by the Melbourne Convention Center, and I see the sign. It says, you know, the weekend, and it says, Salvo's Gathering, and then right underneath it, it says, Sexpo, Australasia's largest sex show, and it's on the same weekend, and I'm like, all right, so I go to the committee, and I say, what are we going to do about Sexpo? And the committee chair says to me, don't worry, we talked to the manager, 
He said that Sexpo participants will use door A, <laughs> and Salvation Army participants will use door C, and we really shouldn't ever see each other. And I said, well, thank God. I thought I was going to go to a Salvation Army conference and run into a sinner. <laughs> <laughs> And sensing my sarcasm was from the Lord. <laughs> he said, what did you have in mind, Danielle? And I said, I got some ideas. Are there any drums around? <laughs> <laughs> I said, leave it with me. I'll figure it out. So I call the general manager of Sexpo. And I say, um, hi, I'm Danielle. I'm from the Salvation Army. And he says, don't worry. The manager talked to me. We promise we won't go anywhere near C. We'll just stay in entrance A. I said, no, that's not why I'm calling. I'm calling because I'd like a booth at your show. He said, I'm sorry, what? I said, I'd like a booth at your show. What do I have to do to get a booth at your show? He said, well, why do you want a booth at my show? And I said, well, because I'd like to shut down your industry. I'd like to make the thousands of people coming to your show, which turns out to be hundreds of thousands, by the way, people coming to your show, that the human trafficking is real, it exists, and the sex industry is perpetuating an oppression against women around the globe, and I'd like to shut it down. I figure, like, a Trojan horse effect might be the best way. So if I could get into your show, then I could shut it down from the inside. <laughs> well, and you see what I'm doing here. I'm just trying to get the guy to say, you're not allowed in the show, because what I want to do is I want to host an invasion. That's what it looks like, the glorious, the reenact the glorious history of like our, you know, justice work. And I'm just like, we're going to shut it down. This guy is evil, you know, just whatever it is. And the guy says on the phone, he goes, I just honest, I'm so honored that the Salvation Army would want to be at our show. <laughs> I said, no, that's not the right, that's not... <laughs> That's not it. Like, I'm coming to shut it down. And then I said, and then I started getting, like, more religious because I thought that would work. So I was like, I'm going to tell people about Jesus. Uh, so he's angry. And then I was like, and I'm going to give out Bibles. Like, I'm just like, try, I'm just like, I'm going to give out Bibles and then I'm giving out books. <laughs> and the guy goes, honestly, I just can't get over. It. He said, I am so honored right now. I'm going to fax over a floor plan. And you can pick whatever booth you want <laughs> on the house. I'm so honored. He said, as a matter of fact, I'm going to give free admission to anyone in a Salvation Army uniform. <laughs> I said, I'll let the committee know right away. <laughs> This is not the plan. This is not the history. This is not what I thought. This is not even what I wanted. This is not what I could conceive. This is not what I figured out. This is not so, uh, but what am I gonna do now? I have to have a booth at this freaking sex show. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't want anyone to actually see this. It's dark, it's gross. It's like, so I thought, who can I, who can I get to help me? And I thought, oh, I know. Retired Salvation Army officers, women. N you ever go to a sex show and think you're going to run into your grandma? <laughs> right? I need some Ingrid's, so I called every Ingrid I know. I'm like, I need every small, old, you know, person that you would normally see ringing a bell at Christmas. I need those guys. I need an army of those guys at the sex bow. You know what I mean? So I, I called them and they were like, we're in, put us in. This is what we're born for. Like, come on, we'll be light. Well, you know, we're just like, yes. I or mobilize this army of retired women <laughs> and just put them on at this, you know, this thing. And they're praying for people. There's a lineup at the booth. I mean, it's insane. Just people, people wanting prayer. We put up this prayer booth. We had this anti-trafficking thing. I remember the general manager, when I was setting this up, he's looking at the, the list of Bibles. He's looking at the Bibles, and he goes, oh, what's that? I said, that's a Bible. He goes, could I have one? I'm like, oh, this guy. I'm like, I guess you could have one if you start in Revelation when you're like, you're going to go to hell, you know, like, 
the nicest bad guy I've ever met in my life. I just... Anyway, I go in to check on them one day. I, I'm checking in them all the time. You okay? Everything okay? They're like, this is incredible. I'm looking at the lineups of these, these, these old, retired, beautiful saints of God just, just praying for people who are actually so hungry for connection and love. And uh, I come in and I say, Marnie, it's Marnie. She's beautiful. And she says, I said, how's it going? She said, Danielle, these people, these, these young people, she said, they're so beautiful. They're so open. It's been incredible. And she said, but I hope everything's going to work out all right. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, there was this one young man. He came. He was so lovely. He came and he signed our wall and he took a Bible and he asked for prayer and I prayed with him and then he had a photographer with him and so we, he asked if he could take a picture and I said, sure, we took a picture and then she said, it wasn't until he walked away that I realized he wasn't wearing anything. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sure it'll be fine. I'll let the committee know. Morning paper, national paper, <laughs> Salvation Army grandma with her arm around, you know, Australia's Chippendale of the year. And the headline says, Salvos do sexpo. And then the phone call started. I mean, the phone calls from churches saying we'd lost our nerve, watered down the gospel, compromised with the darkness. My social justice friends were like, you're justifying the sex industry. How could you be on a same you know, place as this general manager, this evil man? I'm like, I know. Ah! It's so frustrating. I didn't want to be. I tried. I didn't. I was trying to do an invasion. Ah. The phone calls from the radio station started. The television talk shows started. All they wanted to ask is, why are you at Sexpo? And I said, I'm here. <laughs> because the deepest longings of people's hearts are not sex, it's love. And I only know of one kind. I'm here because there's an oppression against an entire generation that is sexual slavery, and we need to tell people about it and stop it, and what better place to begin. I'm here because this is where the people are who need the light of the world in the dark, dark place that they find themselves. Millions of people heard that message, and that strategy began to spread. It is never what you think. And it is so rarely what you want. It's so rarely what it is that you've projected it to be. When you're following with Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a creative source of light to the world. The chaos does not bother Holy Spirit, by the way. Uncertainty does not bother Holy Spirit. You not having it together or not no, does not bother Holy Spirit. That's where Holy Spirit created all things. Not with light, with chaos. The Holy Spirit hovered over the chaotic, dark, foreboding, empty, I don't know what to do, where am I going to go, the anxiety of that, the, uh, the, what am I, ah, that's where the Holy Spirit does the best work. The creative process of God. And this is Paul discovering that. So he, he, he has a vision of a man and he meets a woman. And that woman will become the first church leader in, the, in that, that part of the world, in Europe. That woman will host a church, become a house leader. That woman will carry a, a message. That woman will be a significant part of the advancement of the gospel on the planet. And Paul didn't see that one coming. But she's not the only woman. Then Paul goes, as is his custom, into the city, into the philosophers where people are talking about what, what they need, what the world wants. Listen, on verse 16, one day we're going down to the place of prayer. We met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. And she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God and they've come to tell you how to be saved. 
This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and instantly it left her. Um, how many of you would be irritated by somebody saying, this leader is a servant of the most high God and they've come to tell all of you how to be saved? How is that an irritation? I mean, have you guys, I thought my whole life that Paul was irritated at the girl. Did you? I always thought, I mean, I always read this, like Paul is like, this girl is like saying this and he's like, you know what? I'm sick and tired of you saying this. But I don't think I read it right. What is Paul sick and tired of exactly? What is Paul sick and tired of exactly? I think Paul is sick and tired of oppression. I think he's sick and tired of men using a young girl for their wealth creation. I think Paul is sick and tired of a system and a demonic spirit Literally, the spirit of Python, it tells us, that constricts and restrains and sucks the life out of the people it possesses. I think Paul is tired of a proclamation of a gospel without a demonstration of its power. And the demonstration of the power of the gospel is not in the big things, it's in the small. The demonstration of the power of the gospel is when that holy power is used for the least important person in the society. That demonstration of the power of God is demonstrated not in Paul being an incredible leader, but in Paul being a leader willing to lay down his life in order to free a girl who doesn't even have a name. The advance of the church, the advance of God's good news, the advance of what God wants to do through us into the unknown, into those places we haven't even imagined, into those places where we already know, will always have at its core a proclamation of who Jesus is and then a demonstration of what that means. Now, I think the reason Paul waited so long is because he was calculating the costs of this. I think this isn't how he saw it going. I think Paul was thinking, I've got to get to an important philosopher. I have to get to a city leader. I have to get, eventually, Paul, all he wants to do is get to Caesar because somehow we're convinced that if we can get to people with more worldly power, it'll be good for the gospel. I don't know where we got that from. Certainly, Jesus didn't demonstrate it. He avoided them like the plague. He was not interested. Jesus went out of his way to get in the way of people who were excluded, people who didn't count, people who were on the lower socioeconomic ladder, people who were invisible, people who were easily used and discarded, people who you could throw away in society, people who could in public exploit this girl and nobody would do a single thing about it. And Paul couldn't take it anymore. He just couldn't take it anymore. And what Paul does is he demonstrates the power of the gospel by liberating the girl from oppression in the cost of it. The cost of it. You know what happens next, right? He's beaten. He's dragged into public. And this is a great advance. Well done, Paul. I'm pretty sure this was not in his strategic plan. He's persecuted. He's put in jail. As a matter of fact, they know that this guy is so powerful because they just witnessed him free, expose, and liberate a girl from oppression. So they put him in the center of the center of the prison under guard. They're kind of afraid, but they're not willing to actually deal with their own oppressive practices. They're not really to deal with the fallout of that, which means they're going to lose money. They're not willing to deal with that. But Paul is, and his companions are in prison. And then you know, there's one of my best stories in the world, Acts chapter 16. Do you remember this? What does the power of God do? It breaks him out of prison. It breaks him out of prison. And then we're like, 
That's the power of God. It breaks him out of prison. You remember that story? Read it. It's remarkable. They're out of prison. They're literally, I don't even know how that works. But like the print, they would have been jailed to a wall, like handcuffed to a wall. And somehow the power of God shook the prison enough that they're free. And then they're like, bye-bye. You shouldn't mess with the power of God, man. No one comes against the Lord's anointed. You can't touch this. And then they're like, this must be the plan of God. This must be the plan of God. God's power on display. Okay, so we, we took a risk. We proclaimed the gospel. We demonstrated his power by centering someone who the world has decentered, by taking the most oppressed person we can find who does not count for anything in that society and making our lives about serving them, making our lives about demonstrating the kind of power we have and how to use that power. And then we get arrested and then we get persecuted and then the power of God comes and frees us because that's our God. He's greater and he's stronger and he's higher and you can't contain the power of God. And then this Roman guard, the centurion, the guy that locked him up, the guy that was his jailer, starts to commit suicide. He says, I, that's, I'm, I'm it. And he, he's, he's gonna kill himself. And do you remember what Paul does? I mean, Paul, I mean, he just says, dude, live by the sword, die by the sword. If you're going to serve Rome, that's what it's going to land. If you're going to, you know, unjustly persecute people, that's, what, that's what's going to happen. No, I mean, I envision it like this. Dude, what you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? He goes, well, you're going to go, so I got to go. Paul looks at them and says, we're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. Where do you see the power of God in there? When the Roman centurion guard, the one who was his enemy, comes to him and says, what's that? What's that? What is that power that would lay down your freedom and your life for me, your enemy? This is not just theologically good. <laughs> this is practically hard to live out. But it is essential if the gospel is going to advance. And if the gospel is going to advance as good news to the poor, and if the gospel is going to advance not just as a proclamation that we believe, but as a demonstrated witness of what it means. Proclamation and demonstration. That general manager of the Sexpo and I went on. I did marriage counseling and married him to his significant other. We went on to do a circuit of talks around Australia about the sex industry. And he ended up going to, he had been invited to go to Asia to start a sexpo there. And he assured me that he wasn't in that part of the industry. And I assured him he was. <laughs> and that God had put us together to give him revelation, to give him insight so that he could see and he could help and he could stop the oppression that was happening. And he assured me it wasn't like that. And then he went over to Asia, and he called me from a hotel room, shaken. Danielle, they just took me to cages. Cages with hundreds of girls. Numbers on their cages, not names. And he wept, and he wept, and he said, it's worse than I thought. This is the power of God. This is the power of God. It's not what you expect. It's not what you plan. It's not what you know. It includes a lot of wrestling and a lot of frustration and a lot of discernment and an openness. But it's the way forward. A proclamation of the gospel and a demonstration of its power. It's how good news gets to the ends of the world. 
I'm going to invite you to pray with me. I've been trying to figure out how to do this. You know, just not one time or glorious times, but how to do this as a lifestyle, how to practice this, how to become aware of a discerning relationship with Jesus where I know when to let go and when I know when to hang on. I've been trying to figure out, you know, how do I cultivate not just principles in my life, but a practice of relationship with Jesus, a practice a practice of inviting the Holy Spirit to direct me and to teach me, a practice of trusting that God is going to use me wherever I am, whether I can understand it or not. I was trying to figure out, like, how does this happen on a daily basis? I was, I was, I was in a, a pub after a, a leader friend of mine had crashed and burned in, 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 his, in his life. And I remember all of us saying, like, how did that happen? You ever wonder that in your own uh, friends in ministry that are no longer in ministry or their marriages are gone or their affairs have happened or abuse happened or all these things. You're just like, how does this happen? And I remember sitting around this table. I mean, this guy was smarter than me and, and better than me in so many ways, missionally more advanced than me, just an incredible person that I looked up to. And they're like, how does this happen? And we sat around with a group of friends and we just said like, how do we even not know this was happening? And then we literally just started to go like, how are you? <laughs> how are you for real? Like, who do we confess our sins to? Like, who do we commune and collectively discern things with? Like, how do we go in directions where we're afraid? Are we even following Jesus? And I mean, I know we're following Jesus. Because like, you know, 27 years ago or whatever, I said yes to Jesus. And so now I'm following Jesus. But today, am I following Jesus? Is the Spirit of Christ directing me today? Is the Spirit of Christ going, no, don't go there? And I'm going, oh, okay, I thought I was going, I'm not going. Is the Spirit of Christ going, is the Spirit of Christ going, how about over here? Is the Spirit of Christ leading me in places where I'm able to confront my prejudices? Is the Spirit of Christ leading me in a strategy that I'm unfamiliar with because I've never done it before? Is the spirit of Christ leading me in such a way that I'm willing to lay down my traditions in order to see what it is that God's doing right now? Is the spirit of Christ actually in relationship enough with me where I'm in partnership with Christ and I'm confused and disturbed, but that's actually the evidence that I'm doing it with God? <laughs> Am I living that way? And we decided to actually practice we decided to practice following Jesus every day. It sounds ridiculous. But I decided in my heart of hearts that what I needed was not just some belief. What I needed was not just some decision I made to follow Jesus. That was how I got started. But what I needed was a daily practice that would allow me to both receive and work in the power of the Holy Spirit on a daily basis basis where I would choose every single day to learn, to try, to together figure out how I was going to follow Jesus for today. And it has been a game changer. It has been a game. Not did I once, but am I now, today, this day. And I want to invite you to to join me in a prayer that I pray every day, postures that I practice every day. One posture we did last night is surrender. It's a power posture in the kingdom of God. Discerning what that surrender looks like is the work of you and your community and Holy Spirit. Generosity, that freely I've received, now freely I give. That's the literal only thing Jesus said was necessary as the disciples went on, out on mission. Freely you've received, now freely give. And a posture of mission that says, I'm going to center the least important person in the room. I exist for them. This is why the Holy Spirit has been given to me to demonstrate the power of God right where I am. So I'm going to invite you to stand. And if you want, you can repeat after me. <clears throat> I use, a, I use my body to pray. It helps me harness my mind a little bit. And I start with a confession because it also just, I feel like 
confession's just good for the soul. If you want to repeat after me, I'm going to invite you to do that. So I put my hands in fists like this, like I'm about to have a fight. And I simply just, I, 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 I pray this. I confess my natural human posture is to make a way to fight for it, to defend, to control. But I choose as a follower of Jesus to give up and over to his lordship. You can have all there is of me today. All the burdens, all the blessings, all the opportunities. My whole life belongs to you. And then I hold my hands out in front of me in fists like this, and I make this confession. I confess my natural human posture is to take, it's to keep, it's to grasp, it's to hang on. But I choose by the power of the Holy Spirit because I follow Jesus to open my hands. Freely I receive. Now take just a, a minute here and ask for what you need for today. It's wisdom, it's given generously. Is it courage and boldness? What do you need? Mercy, new every morning. You're struggling with forgiveness, you're struggling with, with fear. Love could be poured out. Boundless love, receive it. Receive it, receive it, receive it. Vision, receive it. And then I just simply say this, everything I have so freely received, I'm gonna give it away today. And then the last posture is I cross my arms and I make this confession. I confess my natural posture is to keep to my own plans, to protect myself, to stand at a distance, to spectate, to critique, to say it's not my problem. But I choose as a follower of Jesus and filled with the Spirit to open up my posture in life in mission. I say to the lost, to the last, to the least, to those overlooked, to those things too hard, to those people I don't like, to that person on the farthest side of the globe, And those ones right next to me. My life is open to you. You're welcome here. Like the prodigal father, I run to you. Yeah, we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>Wasn't that awesome? We've truly been blessed. I feel, Danielle, that you've given us the how this morning in terms of how to minister God's power faithfully in our community and the how to confront. So we thank you. And I, I wonder if you would come back so that we could bless you and pray for you this morning. You know, as we were worshiping earlier, and I know you're not one for titles. I know we've met enough to know, <laughs> to know that. But I felt that God just really spoke to me that Danielle is one of his generals right now. And, um, you know, as one of his generals, she's out there supporting others on the battlefield. 
She's on the battlefield herself. And uh, she needs support, prayer, protection as well. So I'm asking you to stretch out your hand this morning. And we're going to pray over Danielle. And I'm going to ask you as well not just to pray today, but to keep Danielle covered in prayer as she goes about the earth, talking about God's power and how that difference to worldly power and how she goes about confronting those powers. So Father God, we come before you this morning. We are excited to have heard you speak through Danielle and others this week. We're so grateful for every word you've brought. And Father, we thank you that right today, this morning, last night, we were challenged in our thinking around power and confrontation. And you've taught us, you've shown us the how through her words and her actions. So Father, we lift her before you this morning and ask that you would bless her in all of her comings and goings. We pray you bless her husband, her three boys, her family, Lord God, and all she holds dear. Lord God, bless her, Lord God, in her life with others, in church community and in communities all around the world. Father, we ask, Lord God, that you would protect her faithful witness, that you would go before her in every circumstance, and Lord, that she would hear your voice wherever she is. So Lord, pour forth your abundance and blessing upon her, Lord God, in ways that she cannot dare to ask, that she can continue to minister throughout the earth as your general, doing your will and modeling for us what it means to move in the power of the Holy Ghost in these days. So Holy Ghost, fill her and bless her each day. Equip her and empower and take her, Lord God, to the places that she couldn't even imagine. And may she see your kingdom come, your will being done. In Jesus' name and through his meekness. Amen. Bless you. Bless you. Isn't God good? He's so kind to us, so generous with what he's poured into our lives. I just want to remind you, um, in your program, we've got some seminars this morning that you can still engage with, so I encourage you to go along to those. There's also going to be a book signing from Danielle in the exhibition area, so if you'd like to go along and um, do that, please do. And just before we leave, wouldn't it be great to just say thank you to the staff here and the volunteers who've just (laughs) given so much time? We're just so grateful. (laughs) 